Hello everyone. Uh, this time around, I'm going to talk about some of the SJW uh, nonsense that, that goes on. I've talked about it before, but it's not going away, so I'm going to talk about it again. Uh, for those not in the know, SJW stands for Social Justice Warrior, and for people that are not Social Justice Warriors, it's an insult to, uh, to uh, apply to the Social Justice Warriors. Uh, is the whole social justice warrior thing is about victimhood. Uh, it's about being a victim. But dressing it up like somebody else is always an aggressor. But these people, uh, they, they, they're not actually honest about anything. Uh, what what they tend to do say you you say you're giving a lecture and you say something that uh, some special snowflake in the audience uh, finds insulting or invalidating to their existence or disrespectful or something like that and it might be and it might be something as ludicrous as the, they they feel that the value of pi isn't 3.1415 etc like seriously, it's getting that crazy in some some places, where things that are known to be true, that or are defined a certain way, or are blindingly obvious to anybody who can do uh, basic reasoning, uh, that's the sort of thing that is now being considered taboo because it might invalidate somebody's existence or something like that. But anyway, if you do offend some special snowflake, they'll probably end up going to administration or whatever and demanding an apology and some sort of restitution or, or whatever. Now here's the thing. You shouldn't give it. Well, if you, if you feel that you really did step over a line, then okay, fine, an apology would be warranted. But if it's, if it's just somebody is offended by a scientific theory or something like that, you should not be apologizing or doing anything to, to make them feel better. Uh, just because you mentioned a belief that's contrary to theirs, you should not be required to apologize to them or anything like that. But let's say you do. Well, what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to stop there. Uh, if, it, if it stopped there, then it wouldn't be quite so pernicious. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, the next thing you know, the goalposts will be moved further down the road, and now they'll be demanding something more as a result. And this is basically the modus operandi of the, of the SJWs. They will go for something that they think they can get, and if they get it, they'll go for something incrementally further, and they'll keep pushing and pushing. And nothing short of committing harakiri is going to uh, is going to appease them. And even then, ritual suicide probably wouldn't appease them. Uh, and, and so, basically, once you're targeted by the SJWs, you have lost. You cannot win. So the best thing you can possibly do for yourself is at least attempt to opt out of the game. Don't play the game. Refuse to kowtow to them. You're not going to come out ahead if you do that. But you're also not going to come out ahead if you play their game. So if you're going to lose either way, Lose in a way where you keep your self-respect. That, that's what I'm saying. Is you Don't cave to the SJWs at the expense of your self-respect. 
caving to the SJWs is if everybody caves, nobody pushes back, then this cancer on our society will never be excised. It will never be dealt with properly. And, you know, it's, this is, it, and it's frightening where this will end up. Uh, if we keep, if, if this spreads, and it is spreading, if it spreads in the, to the wrong places, the next thing you know, there will be thought police roaming the streets, and anybody who who isn't uh, who who isn't up on the good speak and the good think will find themselves shipped off to re-education centers and all sorts of bullshit like that. Uh, you, know, and, you know, people talk about uh, about 1984. You know, the or Orwell's novel uh, as uh, well. That could never really happen. Well, yeah, it could happen. And, and the reason I'm saying it could happen is look at what the world's doing today. If we keep doing what we're doing. We are heading for the dystopian setup, the, the, the type of dystopia that you see in 1984. We're, we're heading for the, the, uh, th that nasty type of, uh, of, well, interesting enough, the original utopia, when the term was coined, is what would be called a dystopia today. And we're heading for that type of, of society. And that's terrifying. Because it's almost certain that should that happen, everything falls apart. Uh, it... it uh, it worries me that we're seeing this as the SJW th think moving into things like into politics. Uh, there, there at least was a bill at the federal level in Canada that was uh, going to be legislating some nonsense related to pronouns and so on, uh, as I understand it. Uh, which I, I don't know if that actually has gotten anywhere. But uh, certainly, uh, if it does pass, and it could, uh, if it hasn't already, um, I certainly hope the, uh, the Viceroy, you know, the Governor General, or, or the Queen herself refuses to sign it, because it's just crazy. Uh, the, the idea that somebody can force me to use their own choice of arbitrary pronouns when talking about them. That's ludicrous. Now, I don't know if that's what this bill is, is actually... I, I think, actually, that's what this bill is all about, uh, possibly among other things. But the notion that... Um, that if, uh, if I happen to use the wrong pronoun, I get hauled up before a kangaroo court, otherwise known as a human rights tribunal, which, near as I can tell, is probably unconstitutional. Uh, and if it's not, it should be. Uh, you know, that, it, that is basically a guilty until proven guilty setup, kangaroo court, where you have no possible way of defending yourself. The, things happen in secret. They can execute searches without warrants. All sorts of bullshit like that. They're basically the thought police. And we've already got these tribunals established. And, you know, quite frankly, it should be a badge of honor if you get tagged by one of them. Because... They're a symptom of society gone out of control. But anyway, back to the whole pronoun thing. They're trying to legislate language usage, language structure. 
And they're also trying to uh, legislate, you know, me, like force me to use a pronoun to refer to you that is at odds to the structure of the English language as I have been speaking it for uh, close to 40 years. And when you think about that, it's doomed to fail. It's not going to work. I don't think about the pronouns I, I select to refer to somebody. They, it just happens. It's automatic. It's part of being fluent in English. The pronouns just come when you need them. So I'm not going to change the pronouns that I choose just because some politicians decided that I must. Now, let's, uh, let's pick, pick on another thing here. Uh, and that is, even if I wanted to comply with this, which I don't and I won't, and I'm not the only person to say that, even if I wanted to comply with this, uh, exactly how am I supposed to know what pronoun some person I've never met and never had contact with, how am I supposed to know what pronouns they want me to use to refer to them? How? And if I'm going to be punished for using the wrong ones in a situation where I can't possibly know what the right ones are, how is that just? It clearly cannot be just. It's asking me to do something that is impossible. Okay? Now, even if I do know, it's, uh, it's still dicey. But at least if I do know what they want, I have the, I, I can potentially comply with it. But in most cases, the only time you need the pronouns is when you're talking about somebody, you know, in the third person. Generally meaning they're not there. That's an important point. If I'm using the third person pronouns, there's a very, very good chance the person I'm talking about is not actually present. So how can they possibly be offended by anything I'm saying if they're not actually there to hear it? Right? Anyway, leaving aside whether this is a reasonable thing to uh, legislate or not, Let's look at whether it's even something that could work at all. Now, this goes down to the way language itself works. Now, there's, there's two different groups of words. There's, there's open class words and closed class words. Now, these are not prescriptive uh, definitions. They, they're just classifying the, t the words as they are, exist and are used. Open class words are things like... Um, nouns and verbs and stuff that uh, that can morph around uh, quite readily and and, and change uh, to you know to, for new meanings and so on, and they come into the language fairly easily. You know, just like um, for instance, blog for a uh, public. Uh, journal presented in reverse chronological order on a website. Uh, or Google as a verb, meaning look something up on the interwebs, uh, usually using the Google search engine. Uh, you know, th that's, those are open class words. Closed class words, though, those are your, your functional bits of the language. Uh, the, 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 the scaffolding, so to speak. The, the things that define relationships, uh, uh, things like that. And th these are your pronouns and uh, articles and prepositions, you know, that sort of thing. And it's much, much, much harder to introduce 
new closed class words into a language. The reason for that is they are used so much. They're such an in integral part of the language that they necessarily change slowly. That they, they necessarily, uh, well, they take a long time for any changes generally to, to take place. And I think part of, the, part of the reason for that is that people, they're, they're not the sort of thing that, they don't convey main meaning. You know, that's your, your big words like uh, Google and blog and sleep and, and, you know, that sort of thing. But these, these closed class words are the workhorses of the language that, act, you know, they, they tie everything together. And they, they underlie everything and to, to a point that you don't even think about them when you're, when you're talking. You will reach for the right noun or the right adjective or the right verb. How often do you reach for a pronoun? How often do you reach for a preposition? How, how often do you reach for the correct article? Well, you don't. They just come automatically. You don't, there's, there's no real conscious thought behind what, which of these function words you select. They're strict in their usage, in, in how they, they function. So while a pronoun replaces a noun, uh, you would, and you would think it would behave exactly like a noun, and for the most part it does, well, it, uh, it doesn't, it isn't open like a noun, it, you know, uh, it's, it's a fixed functional part of the language. If you look at the history of English, it's been many centuries since a new pronoun came into the language. It's a very long time. In that time, pronouns have shifted around a bit but new ones have not come in. And by shifted around, I mean thou dropping out of usage and you shifting over to, to the singular side to take its place, uh, which likely happened, uh, well, for a, a bajillion different reasons, but it would have been a grassroots change. Uh, and that's another point. Languages don't change by fiat from above. They change from the grassroots usage. The, the, the speakers of the language change what they're doing. That changes the language. New words get accepted at the grassroots level of whatever community uh, is speaking the language. Uh, sure, we might be able to identify who initially coins a word or something like that. But you can't force a word to be adopted. You could coin all the words you want, but you're, you're not going to make fetch happen, uh, uh, for instance, to reference a, a movie. Uh, bonus points if you recognize the movie. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't just make some sort of uh, word that you've just invented catch on. If the grassroots accepts it and starts using it, it catches on. If the grassroots does not accept it, it won't catch on. Uh, and, and, and I don't think anybody really understands the mechanism behind what causes a new word to catch on. What is clear, though, is that it's much easier to get a new open class word to catch on than for a closed class word. People have been trying to add a gender neutral third person singular pronoun into English for more than a century. And there have been many dozens of suggested pronoun sets to add to, to English to solve this problem. Uh, none of them in 125 years or so have caught on. None of them. 
That should be telling us something. There is a real gap in English and that there, that there isn't a gender neutral third person singular pronoun. Although interestingly enough, if you go back far enough in history, there was, it just didn't sound different enough from the, the other pronouns and it dropped out of usage as it wasn't distinct enough. It basically merged with the, the other ones. Uh, and a new one hasn't appeared in all that time since. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, data point on its own. And people have been actually trying, various people at various times have tried to introduce new gender neutral pronouns over 125 years or possibly longer, and none of them have caught on. It didn't matter who was pushing this new pronoun set. None of them have caught on. And that's likely because the grassroots doesn't really see that there's a benefit to these new pronouns uh, subconsciously. And so many of many people, uh, they don't understand that these closed class words, they're used so unconsciously that stopping to think about what pronoun you're going to use is just, it's disruptive to actual conversation. So it's really hard to get people to change and trying to force them to change by fiat with law is likely going to fail just as hard as all of these other, uh, these other uh, attempts. It's going to fail. So, uh, and that also leaves aside the reach of the relevant law, uh, because English is spoken in so many different countries uh, with slight variances, but still mutually intelligible for the most part. Uh, trying to legislate in one country a set of pronouns, well, it's not going to affect any other country. So there's going to be large external pressure not to uh, go in that direction. So the speakers of the language will will maintain their core English that they've always spoken. And if they're forced to use these other pronouns, they'll, well, they'll kind, maybe kind of sort of half-assed to try it. And then when there's nobody watching, they'll go back to their old habits, right? You know, because it's unconscious selecting the pronoun to use. Now, anyway, Getting getting back to this, now that I've uh, gone through why I don't think this is going to work, trying to force new pronouns on people, uh, let's go back to this forcing people to use the pronouns that, uh, that I want them to use to refer to me. Well, quite frankly, it's not going to work for the same reasons. Pronoun choice is not a conscious choice. It just happens. Unless you get into a situation where you can't figure out how to say what you want to say and you have to think about it. But that's not the normal case. Generally, the pronoun thing just happens. For whatever selection logic is in our heads, it just happens. So, forcing me to use your choice of pronouns when talking about you, not going to work. Especially if you are uh, are one of those wing nuts that wants to use any one of these dozens of sets of uh, manufactured uh, you know pronouns that uh, various uh, types have been trying to get uh, get out there for 125 years and have failed. Now. I do accept that a gender neutral pronoun is a reasonable thing. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to one. It's just something that's got to feel like English. And it's got to be something that uh, will 
get some grassroots acceptance. Now, I hate to break it to people, but there is one that is gaining increased acceptance. And the pedants do not like it, and they will say anything to get people to stop doing it, even though there is a history of its usage in this manner and a precedent for the migration. And that is the singular they. It's still somewhat controversial in academic circles, but it's more and more common in everyday speech. And hell, I even see myself writing it. Caught myself writing it today uh, for a, an indeterminate singular entity. And you know what? It feels like English. Because it's an existing English word, it's a closed class word, but it's not changing class. It's not moving from being a nothing to a pronoun or a pronoun to a verb. It's still a pronoun, right? So they, them, their, themself, or their self. Note that self changes from selves because it's singular, but that's just another rule on how English works, right? So it just fits. But uh, uh, it's like yourself versus yourselves, right? Uh, so it, it follows, it fits. And because we've already had you migrate and do the same thing. And yes, it's unfortunate that you lose a distinction in the, pro in the process. You lose the singular plural distinction in a lot of cases. Uh, so yeah, that is potentially unfortunate. And then we might need uh, some other marker to, uh, in some cases, to indicate plural or singular. Uh, and we do that with you, with things like you all. Uh, you know, this can be uh, this can be worked around, but they is actually migrating into the singular. I don't think he and she are going to disappear, but they is moving in to fill the gap uh, for the lack of a third person singular personal pronoun. You would have thought as an outside observer, potentially, that it should be the right pronoun to use, and that would be the one that would move in. But it's got so much baggage of implying non-person that I think it was a lost cause. It was doomed to not take on that role. And I think possibly because it's already overloaded enough with different classes of usage. Uh, so they is moving into that position. Eh, and it'll work fine. After all, people are using it and it's working. Uh, it still sounds a bit odd to my ear when I hear it, but for the most part, it's kind of working. And I fully expect if you were to come, you come back and look at English left to its own devices in 100 years, 150 years, singular they will be perfectly accepted and standard. Now, I don't expect these new pronouns will get any kind of acceptance at all. Uh, because they're not existing pronouns. That's the thing they, singular they, has going for it. It's already there. It already exists. And we just need to add an additional meaning to it in our mental uh, vocabulary. Uh, adding new made-up words that have no inherent meaning to us, that makes it a harder cognitive leap to adopt it, especially for a low-level functional word. So I do accept that a gender-neutral third-person singular pronoun is reasonable, and I also recognize that we're probably moving in the direction that we will have one eventually. 
But I do not accept that somebody should be able to force me to use a specific pronoun to refer to them. Instead, what they should be doing is persuading me what pronoun to use. And quite frankly, I think it's perfectly reasonable that if the person is presenting as female, then the female pronouns used. And if they're presenting as male, the male pronouns used. And if you can't tell, then the, then a gender neutral uh, pronoun, uh, or if you happen to know, then the correct pronoun, right? That's as far as it should go. And that is all based on my perception, my knowledge of the person, not what they want me to do. Because that's not how the third person pronouns work. They are describing something or someone that is not an immediate part of the, you know, the exchange, right? They're the, that person over to the side. I, I'm talking about them, but I'm not talking to them. So there's a good chance they're not even present. And that's, that is an important point. And even if they are present, well, if they are present, then they can pipe up and say, no, you, you got it wrong. I'm actually male, not female, or vice versa. And, you know, per, and, and then you can go, okay, cool, and then correct your mental model of the world and go on about your business. But for the most part, we do a pretty good job of identifying how people present themselves and unconsciously select the correct pronoun. There's no reason we should change that. Uh, and because it's unconscious, I don't think we can, laws or not. Uh, some social justice warrior in demanding respect by, from me by saying I must use their, their chosen pronouns or I'm disrespecting them. Uh, none of that matters. And quite frankly, if I don't know you or I've just met you, I don't respect you. I don't disrespect you necessarily, but I don't respect you. You have to earn that. Respect is not automatic. It cannot be, or respect is meaningless. It's not respect if it's, if it's forced. It could be politeness or courtesy or something, but it's not respect. And just because I don't respect you, it doesn't mean I disrespect you either. It's not a binary situation. So rather than insisting on my respect without demonstrating that you deserve it, you should, you should just accept that English works a certain way and accept that the unconscious way that we select pronouns is the way the language works and that selecting a particular pronoun is not an insult or a sign of respect or anything like that. It's not. It just is. Well, anyway, uh, that's probably getting way off in the weeds here. But anyway, this is just one example of how the the social justice mindset is screwing with society. And quite frankly, if it keeps going the way it's going and legislation like, um, you know, what, what, is, what was the, uh, was it C-16 or something? Uh, I, I, I'd have to look it up. Legislation like that, uh, if more of that gets, gets out there and, and starts happening, then, you, you know, we're, we're seriously going down. Uh, you know, we, we, it, it's starting to become abundantly clear that we've hit the decline phase of the golden age. Uh, we're, we're now past the peak of the golden age, uh, the current golden age of Western society. We're past the peak and it's declining. And if it keeps going, we're going to end up into the decline and fall of Western civilization. And it looks like the social justice 
mindset and uh, others of this of similar ilks they're they're uh, pushing very hard in this direction and it won't be very much longer if we keep going down this path before western civilization falls and becomes yet another footnote in the history of the world. Now, by fall, I don't mean that all of our technology and all of our, our advances will disappear. I don't mean that. I mean that the, the advances in, uh, in thought and, and that sort of thing they will stop and reverse and disappear. And some and eventually some other place will rise with the freedoms necessary to advance again. So I don't and while we won't necessarily see another dark ages, which weren't nearly as dark as people think they were, uh, there's a really good chance that we're headed for an age of stagnation. And, and quite frankly, if we keep with what we're doing, we'll deserve it. Uh, so basically, what I'm saying is we need to tell these social justice warriors to shut the fuck up and go away. Uh, that we, we need to stop pandering to them. We need to start forcing them to face the world as it is and not as they wish it to be. Otherwise, we're going to end up with an entire society that cannot face the world as it is, and that's a recipe for disaster. And eventually, it will lead to a catastrophic collapse of the society. Maybe not Armageddon, but a catastrophic collapse, nonetheless. Well, anyway, that's probably enough rambling for this time. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it off here. If you liked the video, or you didn't, leave a like or a dislike. I won't be bothered either way. Uh, I don't validate myself based on the likes or dislikes or even number of subscribers I have on this channel. 21 as of this recording in case I suddenly get popular or something. Uh, if you want to be notified of, of future videos, make sure you do subscribe and turn on notifications. But again, I won't be upset if you don't subscribe. And uh, finally, if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.